السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the creator nourisher cherisher sustainer provider protector and curer of one and all والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We send complete blessings and salutations upon the best of creation the most noble of all prophets of Allah سبحانه وتعالى محمد بن عبد الله May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him his entire household all his companions we ask Allah to bless them, to bless every one of us, to grant us every form of goodness, to bless our offspring, those to come right up to the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us rightly guided. My brothers and sisters, I am indeed humbled by the presence of so many of you in this beautiful city, in this lovely country of Mauritius. And I know it's been a long time since I have come, but MashaAllah, the development that I have witnessed is really something spectacular. As much as we see development from an infrastructural angle, it's important for us to develop ourselves even within. The more we see in terms of technological advancement, in terms of growth, when it comes to our income perhaps, when it comes to our standard of living, perhaps, we need to equate it with the development of our soul, of ourselves, of our character and conduct, our link and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with His Messenger. In fact, the latter needs to be far greater and higher than the former. We need to develop our relationship with Allah and ourselves. We need to develop our character and conduct far more importantly than any other development. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all forms of goodness. Amin. My brothers and sisters, I am here to spread a message of love. There is a lot of hate across the globe, a lot of it. It has resulted in fighting, it has resulted in killing, it has resulted in senseless atrocities that are being committed in the name of religion and in the name of so many other causes. And every time that happens, we need to realize it's our duty to promote the goodness and the love that will extinguish that hate. And for that reason, I want to start off in a unique way. We're talking about building bridges. We're not talking about destroying bridges. We're talking about respect and dignity. We're not talking about development of hatred and ill feeling. So it's very important to realize that the greatest of all is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the maker. Right at the beginning of this talk, I described Allah by saying the maker, the nourisher, the cherisher, the provider, the protector, the curer, in fact, the one in absolute control of every aspect of existence. He whom we worship, Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, the creator, the deity alone. Remember, he did not only create humankind. Together with you and I, and together with humankind, he chose from the very beginning that he would create other creatures. Why? Why did Allah decide that he wants to create other creatures? He created the dogs and the pigs and the monkeys. He created the mountains and the seas and the oceans. He created the birds. He created the ants and the insects, the reptiles. He created that which may be considered harmful to mankind and that which may be considered beneficial. 
He created the lion and the leopard. He created all these creatures. And not only did he create them, but at the time of the prophet Noah, when he was instructed to build the ark, he was instructed together with mankind to take with him two of all the other creatures that the Almighty had made. So Allah wanted to preserve these creatures. From among them, there are those that are harmful to us. We are scared of them. If we had to see a loose lion, wild, running here right now, we would all perhaps try to rush out of this place, causing a stampede, helter-skelter. Everybody's out because there is a lion. This is not its place. But we will pay money to see the same lion in a different place. We will pay. And behind a fence, we will even tease the lion. We will make a face, make a sound. And we are warned, don't do that. But this is what we do. So we end up looking at these animals that would have been harmful with the eye of goodness and even the eye of love. How many of us have seen a lion or a lioness or a cub and we say wow how cute how nice Ooh, how beautiful what a sight quickly take a picture take a picture we say that don't we but that's a lion we are taught that the life that was given to that lion was given by the same giver of your life don't forget that whoever gave you life gave that lion the life we forget that. Subhanallah. So the Almighty created all these creatures. If he wanted, he didn't need to do that. He could have just made mankind. That's it. But Allah says, no. I want you to understand that I am the giver of life. I will give life to whomsoever I wish and to whatsoever I want to give life to. I have given life to the animals. I've given life even to the plants. We see the plantation here. Who is the giver of the life? It's Allah. He gave the life. And this is why we are Muslims. We are taught that you cannot take the life away of the animals in a destructive way. No, I cannot just say, okay, I'm going to shoot all the lions. No, as a Muslim, you're not allowed to do that. Yes, if it was harming you, it came for you, it was attacking you, you have the right to defend yourself. Perhaps you might even take its life away at that juncture, but there was a need for it and you did it in the most humane way. It was unavoidable. That is to do with an animal. It's to do with a lion. We're talking of the example of a lion. But the Almighty has asked us to be respectful towards the creatures that he has given life to. You respect the animals. You know, you and I have been taught that there are certain foods that you will eat and certain foods you will not eat. Well, it would have been easy for you and I to say, well, why did Allah make that if he did not want me to consume it? Who told you that everything he makes should be consumed? Who told you that? He makes certain things because he doesn't want you to consume it and he wants to see if you have within you the love for the Almighty who is the giver of the life enough to respect the life of that which you're not going to be consuming. It's a very deep statement. I'm not allowed to eat, for example, a pig as a Muslim, flesh of a swine, for example. I'm not allowed to consume pork. Does that give me the right to go around harming pigs, throwing stones at them, shooting them and just getting happy and laughing? Not at all. The hadith says, Fi kulli kabidin ratbatin ajrun. Do you know every animal that you are kind to, you reach out to, everything that has a liver, everything that has been given life by the Almighty, if you are kind to it, reach out to it in a positive way, you will earn a reward. So if you are destructive towards it, you will earn a sin. If you go around just taking a gun and shooting the monkeys that are all around, because that's it, you're enjoying shooting monkeys, you're not a good Muslim. 
you have insulted the giver of the life of those monkeys Allah gave the life and that's why I started this way to go back to remind yourselves and myself if you want love to be promoted the beginning of it is to ask yourself who am I and who are the rest of the people around me and who is or what is the rest of the creation what's my connection with it my mother and my father they married many many years back I don't even know back in the 1940s or 50s somewhere perhaps in the 1950s and they had children these children who are they to me my brothers and sisters why because we share a common lineage my mother and my father the same what's the big deal the big deal is it's a very big deal the giver of life who gave you your life and me my life is the giver of the life of all creatures but he chose for you where you would be born when you would be born who you would be born to for a reason that reason is for you to recognize him and for you to recognize him you will have to look at those around you to be able to understand who they are to you and why they are that to you so I take you back to the example of myself my brothers and sisters I did not choose my parents I did not choose the Almighty chose for me and automatically he placed in the hearts of my parents love towards me so when I was a child they loved looking after me the same would apply to all of us if we have children may Allah bless us with good children say Amin Amin I always say even if you're not married and someone says may Allah bless us with good children say Amin because it's a package if Allah blesses you with good children you're gonna have to have a good spouse first you know so it's like if you say oh Allah I want a job help me for a job oh Allah I need to earn at least so much in the month oh Allah oh Allah I want you to help me to buy a house after that and I want you to help me to get a car you know what just start off with oh Allah help me so that I can build my house but don't forget your house in the hereafter please so if Allah accepts that house you're gonna get your job you're gonna get your salary or you're gonna earn your money somehow somewhere so it's an all-in-one it's an encompassing dua same would apply I did not ask to have those parents those brothers those sisters or my own children I didn't ask to have the particular kids that I have I may have asked Allah to bless me with children but I didn't know who they were going to be each one is given life just like I have been given life you have been given life they are beloved to Allah just like I am just like you are because if Allah wanted he could have chosen not to give life to them or to myself so my parents mashallah because I have them in common so I look at my brother I say this is my brother something happens to me he my brother will feel it he will rush to my assistance why he's going to say that's my brother let me help him okay if something happens to a child the parents run to the child or run to the child's assistance because that's my parent that's my child your sister the same applies but who chose that for you it was Allah as a test I encourage you my brothers and sisters those from among you who are not getting along with their own brothers and sisters I encourage you today to sort the matter no matter what it is sort it out it's not impossible sort it out learn to love one another for the sake of Allah and Allah has spoken about this in the Quran in many places and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us how important it is to maintain family ties Allah 
Be conscious of Allah whose name you use when you are asking one another, when you swear an oath, you use the name of the Almighty. Be conscious of Him. And be conscious of the wombs that have given birth to you. Be conscious of the wombs through which you are related and connected. I'm related to my brother through the womb. The womb of whom? My mother. You are related to a relative of yours through what? Through the wombs. The wombs of whom? The mothers. So Allah says, be careful. Learn to respect your mother. Learn to respect your mother. We're talking about respect, dignity. Learn to build the broken bridges. Moments ago, I said, if you have a problem with your brother, mend it. If you don't mend it, you have not understood the plan of the Almighty who chose that brother for you. He's going to ask you on the day of judgment. I told you to resolve your matters and I told you how sinful it was to break relations. Why did you break relations? So a person might say, well, you know what? I broke relations with my parents because they're not Muslim. So Allah, Allah would definitely question us even further because in the Quran, he tells us, be kind to your parents. Whether they are Muslim or not. In the same verses he says, you will be kind to your parents if they are to instruct you to do something that is blasphemous against the Almighty or ask you to associate partners with the Almighty in worship. In that case, you don't obey them, but you continue living with them in goodness, in kindness, with humility etc etc doesn't that prove that even if they're not muslim you have to be kind to them you have to be fulfilling their rights you have to be respectful you have to carry yourself with dignity and you have to keep their dignity intact as best as you can but if they were to instruct you to do something unreasonable to do something detrimental to your link with your maker you politely excuse yourself you politely excuse yourself why so much of politeness with parents? Why? When they're not Muslim, Allah is telling me, be polite, be kind. Even if they were to die in the condition that they were not Muslim, you still continue to fulfill your role. What is it? Be polite, be kind, be respectful, try and help them, serve them, and you will enter paradise. You serve your parents, you get paradise, even when they're not Muslim. How? It's because the Almighty chose them for you. By serving them, you're acknowledging the Creator. That's why Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah has declared and decided that none shall be worshipped besides Him. You worship Allah alone and after that, what do you do? You should be kind to your parents. One might wonder, why did Allah put these two together? He put the two together because He made you and He chose a means through which you would come onto the earth that was your parents. He chose them. You might be in this country because your parents gave birth to you here. It's possible in the case of perhaps the majority of you. Who told them to give birth here? Well, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made that happen here, out of all places. So when Allah created you, He chose so many things for you. And then He told you, right, I want to test you. I want you to, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and I want to see, will you fulfill it or not? Primarily, He tells you, acknowledge me as your maker. Well, if I acknowledge Allah as my maker, I need to acknowledge that He is your maker as well. And I need to acknowledge that he is the maker of all the other creatures, the animals, the plants, the, the oceans, everything else, even that which is part of nature. It's Allah who created all of that. How will I be able to respect Allah 
when I have not respected the creation that the same Allah has made. Subhanallah. Something dear to Allah that he created and I have no respect for it. Do you really think I will be able to respect the one who is above all of that who actually made it? So in order to respect Allah, you need to be able to respect the creatures that Allah has created. This is why whenever we speak of worship, we speak of two types of rights. The rights of the Almighty, that he shall be worshipped alone. And we speak of the rights of the rest of the creatures of the Almighty, starting with what is known as Hukukul Ibad, the rights of the rest of humankind. So a person who is not respectful towards animals cannot be respectful towards Allah because he hasn't understood who those animals belong to or what the animals are, who gave those animals the life. If he had understood that, he would have treated them differently. And this is why even for consumption purposes, Muslims are taught that there is a specific way of taking the life away of an animal that you are going to consume. It needs to be humane. You need to treat it fairly. Look at the people across the globe. When it becomes commercialized to a degree of greed, they lose track of the giver of life. They lose track of the Almighty. It becomes such that they want the money by hook or crook. So they treat the chickens terribly. They treat the cows in a very, very inhumane way. They treat the animals in a way that is unacceptable just because they have greed for the money. The Almighty says, you failed your test. Even if you tried to ensure that the animal was halal, you are sinful for the way you treated the animal before its life was taken away. So much of respect is given to animals that the Almighty tells us that you're not allowed to take the life away of an animal while another is watching. This is through the blessed lips of Muhammad He says, take them away. Don't cause distress. You take the name of Allah, seek the permission of Allah. There should be a purpose for that life being taken away. For example, poultry, because you'd like to consume, but not destructively. You just go around taking life away because the giver of the life was Allah. The reason why we would say Bismillah is to seek permission of the giver of that life to take that life away for a purpose that is noble. We're talking of the animals. So Allah says, you know what? You might be kind. You might be kind. Before I tell you what Allah has said, I'm giving you an example. You might be kind to a chicken because you know that you're going to consume it. You might be good to a sheep or whatever else. You might be good to, you're kind to, when you have purpose, when it's your pet, when there is a need for it. But what if there is an animal that you have no need of? What if there is an animal that you're not allowed to touch as a Muslim? What if there is an animal that there are more rules and regulations governing your relationship with as a Muslim? Such as a dog, for example. I'm, I cannot consume a dog. I can have a dog under certain conditions for certain reasons, but the relationship between us and that dog is such that a lot of us, if there was a dog walking down, we would walk in the other direction. Perhaps many would run away. And even if they wouldn't, if they wouldn't, we would know that there are certain rules and regulations governing your closeness, the proximity, etc., your relation with that particular dog, because it's a dog at the end of the day. But I take you to a beautiful narration that a lot of you may have heard. And those who might be following my Building Bridges series might have heard this every time I speak about Building Bridges because it definitely helps us understand the broader picture. There was a man whom the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the Almighty granted him paradise 
because he was kind to a dog. The narration says the Almighty forgave all his sins because he was kind to a dog. To what? Can you say it? A dog. He was kind to a dog. A dog is not a sheep, a dog is not a cow, a dog is not uh, a bird, a dog is not something, you know, that's on that level, it's on another level altogether. But the hadith says that this man in the desert on a very hot day was very thirsty and he found a well. He decided to go into the well because there was no bucket. And he drank as much water as he wanted and he quenched his thirst. And he got up again. And as he was walking away from the well, he noticed a very thirsty dog. Picture it in your mind. What would you do? What would you do? Tell yourself now while you are listening to me. In your mind, what you would do if you saw a dog panting. To me, it would look like the dog might have rabies. Right? I don't know what I would do. May Allah forgive me. The man looked at the dog and he said to himself, لَقَدْ بَلَغَ هَذَا الْكَلْبِ مِنَ الْعَطَشِ مِثْلَ مَا كَانَ قَدْ بَلَغَ مِنِّي this dog is as thirsty as I was moments ago before I went in the well. But the problem is there is no bucket and there is no way this dog is going to get the water. You know what? Let me go down once again and get water for the dog. So the man went down. He went down the well, but he didn't have a bucket. He didn't have anywhere to take the water back up. So what did he do? He decided to take out his hoof. A hoof was a type of shoe they used to wear at the time. Some of us might know it better as a leather sock. He took it out. He filled it with water. <laughs> Would you ever fill your shoe with water? I'm wearing clocks, by the way. <laughs> he filled his shoe with water. He decided to come up again. I don't know how he carried it, whether it was in his mouth or however, or in his hand. And he got close to the dog. Imagine bringing the dog near to you now. Think about it. How many would do this? I'm honest. May Allah not test me with that. I always pray, oh Allah, don't let me see that dog. <laughs> because I really don't know what I would do. I'm just being honest. So he brought the dog near and he helped quench the thirst of the dog. And the Almighty was watching. Allah was watching. And Allah says, we loved the compassion so much that we forgave his sins. He was basically given paradise because of his compassion to a dog. Respect. What did he do? He respected the animal. Allah respected him. Allah gave him forgiveness and paradise as a result. Why am I giving this example? Where am I going? Let me explain. Take you back to the beginning of mankind when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first of mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter caused a multitude to grow. They were all brothers and sisters, children of Adam, alayhi salam, Adam and Eve, Adam and Hawa, brothers and sisters. And as a result, what happened? They, we all come from one source. Kullukum min Adama wa Adama min Turab. All of you, the Prophet ﷺ says, are from Adam. And Adam is from the soil, he's from the dust. Don't be arrogant. After all, you're from the dust. You're from the soil. And you're all connected. I'm related to you. I feel it. Do you know why I feel it? Because I think about it. Many of us don't think about it. When you don't get along with someone, when you hate someone, when your heart is filled with hate, you forget how closely related you actually are. Because you haven't thought about it. You are clouded by hate. So you don't think, wow, this person is actually related to me. My forefathers and his or her forefathers, they actually met in one man. But we are filled with hate such that we don't even realize. Adam, may peace be upon him. He was... 
our forefather. His wife was Eve, Hawa, alayha salatu was salam. According to us, according to the Christians, according to the Jews, and according to many other Semitic faiths, they believe that the first was Adam and Eve. Adam and Hawa. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon them. If that is the case, and we believe it is, are we not all one family? Are we not all related? We are, but we don't think about it. That's why we don't sit and ponder. We don't think about how Allah created us. So I don't even feel my relationship with you if I don't think about it. When I think about it, I begin to feel it. When your own son has gone astray with a bottle of alcohol or the clubbing and the drugs, what do you do when someone else says, you know what? We need to excommunicate him. We need to throw him out. We need to attack him. We need to beat him up. You will say, I'm the father. Leave it to me. I'll sort it out. Because you feel within yourself, it's my child. It's not easy for me to allow people to harm my child, even though my child might be a person who may not be ideal. Well, are we not all connected brothers, sisters, somehow? We are related. When someone is doing something wrong, remember the respect and the dignity. If you want to be respected as a human being, you need to respect the other person as a human being to begin with, even with your difference. What do you mean even with your difference? Even if I disagree with you, it doesn't make me a person who should be filled with hate against you. I might not like what you're doing. I might disagree quite strongly with the bad behavior or conduct that might be termed sinful, but I respect you as a human being. That is the minimum, the dignity that Allah has given me and you. Adam. Allah says very clearly, indeed, we have honored. We have honored the son of Adam. We have honored him. What type of honor? We gave him dignity, respect. In Surah at teen Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ We have created mankind in the best posture. We honored man. We gave him ability beyond other creatures on earth. On earth. Allah gave you the best posture. I was speaking on Friday at a masjid in Zimbabwe and I spoke to the congregation. They laughed when I told them, can you think of a better place to put any organ of yours within your body? besides where it is right now any organ that you have your nose your eyes your ears your fingers your nails whatever you have any organ can you think of a better place you take it out and put it somewhere better than where it already is can you anyone here put your hand up if you can we can hear what you have to say <laughs> well if you put your hand up you know we wouldn't like to see your mouth here you know Imagine if our mouths had to be where our hands are. We'd start eating money. <laughs> so Allah says, we favored you. We gave you dignity. You know, we have technological advancement. Tell me which other creature of Allah has technological advancement on earth. Have you seen a group of mosquitoes sitting in a small bus going to point B? No. Have you seen a group of ants flying from one point to another in their small little aircraft? No, Techno technology for them is zero. It's nothing. Allah gave us the brain. Allah gave man technological advancement, a brain that is unparalleled, that is completely unique. The best of brains that we have on earth are given to mankind. That's what differs. That what, that's what makes us different from the animals and other creatures of the Almighty. But you know what? We are filled with more hate than all the other creatures. Ta'ala grant us goodness. Unfortunately or fortunately, we'll have to go into overtime, maybe three or four minutes because of the land cruiser, right? Injury time.
So my brothers and sisters, let me take you through one of the most touching incidents in the seerah and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he lost his uncle. He lost his wife Khadija, binti Khawailid, radiallahu anha. He lost, meaning what had happened, they just had sanctions against them as Muslimin, Shi'ab Abi Talib. It was known as Amul Huzun, the year of sadness. He decided, you know what? Let me go out of Mecca. Perhaps the people outside might listen. I've been trying with these people for so long. They haven't heard. He didn't label them. He didn't swear them. He did not insult them. He didn't insult the people of Mecca. And he just kept on trying. Because he knows my job is the trial. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. If Allah wants, he can guide the person you are swearing. And he can take the guidance away from you and I. May he not do that for us. But may he guide us all. So he thought to himself, let me go. And it was from Allah, inspired as well. He went to Ta'if. He decided, let me go to Ta'if. Ta'if is outside, right? When he got to Ta'if, he wanted to call the people towards the beautiful deen, towards honesty, towards respecting the women, towards fulfilling their rights, towards issuing, you know, worshipping Allah alone, and so many other powerful good teachings. What did they do? They insulted him. They started laughing, cracking jokes, insulting verbally. My brothers and sisters, be careful of this habit. It's very bad. You know why? It will result in killing. It will result in stone throwing and killing. If you don't watch your mouth, it will become out of control very soon. So be careful. Watch your tongue. When you disagree with someone, disagree with them with respect. If you don't watch your tongue, you will end up killing one another for butter and bread, for something minor. So what happened to the Prophet ﷺ? They started off with the tongue, mocking. It developed very quickly into stone throwing with the intention of murder. They started throwing. And from the adults, it went to the children. Look at what we are doing. When you as a father do not control your tongue with those whom you disagree with, your children will become so vulgar that they will be an embarrassment for you as an adult. So carry yourself with respect so that at least your children can learn to be respectful. When they disagree on principle, they can disagree with respect. Today we need to go around the globe teaching people how to disagree. May Allah help myself to begin with and then every one of us. So the children started throwing stones and they hurt the Prophet ﷺ. The most blessed droplets of blood ever to exist were, were trickling down the legs of the most blessed of all creation. And imagine they filled the shoes. And at that juncture, the angels came to Muhammad ﷺ by the instruction of Allah saying, O Messenger, there are two mountains here. If you just instruct us, we will bring these two mountains and crush all of these people who have harmed you to this degree. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu except as a means of mercy for all the worlds, for all. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where there was no bridge at all, Ta'if, decided to build the biggest bridge that there could be in that area. What was it? He raises his hands to Allah in supplication and he complains about himself, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dha'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati, oh Allah, I'm complaining to you about myself. I'm weak. You have given me a message to fulfill. Here I am. 
Oh Allah, forgive these, guide these people. Oh Allah, guide these people. They don't know what they're doing. That was his dua. Allahumma di qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide these people. They don't even know what they're doing. It was so easy to say, finish them up. I think that's what a lot of us would have said. You just look back and say, you just nod your head to the gangster at the back to say, finish them. Walk out. Yeah. That's what we would do, especially when you're a bit powerful. This was the most powerful person ever to exist. Most powerful, the most noble, the highest. When we speak of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa there's no competition, there's no comparison. He is at the top. You need to remember this. Creation, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one whom we expect his intercession for us on the day of Qiyamah. And he's standing there saying to the non-Muslims, those who attacked him, they caused the blood to trickle down his leg. He says, oh Allah, guide these people. They don't know. They don't know. He left Taif in a unique way as though he was the loser. But he was not the loser. He just built a huge bridge from which they would all come and accept Islam a few years later. We are so impatient that if someone doesn't think exactly how we think today, he's written off, he's crushed, you can't read Salah behind him, you cannot go to this masjid, you cannot do this, this guy is like that, you can't greet him, you can't talk to him. Where is this? Which prophet are you following, by the way? Here is the prophet of Islam. This is what he did. He made dua. He tried. He spoke. A man came into the masjid and urinated one day. He peed in the corner of the mosque. Subhanallah. Today, one of our youngsters, after watching football, came into the masjid with the three quarters. Half of the people would say, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah, from what? The guy is coming to the mosque. He's coming to the masjid. Encourage him. Give him a, a word of goodness. Why chase him away? There is more pressure for him not to come than for him to come. So you're supposed to welcome him. Rather than that, we broke the bridge, completely destroyed. What else did we do? No respect for a human being who came to the house of Allah. Not your house or mine. Who brought him there? Allah. When Allah drives you somewhere, who brought you there? It's Allah who brings you to his house. Do you see the one who is cursed by Allah? The one who stops people from praying or who stopped the worshiper praying when he wanted to pray. Yes, this verse goes back to Abu Jahl at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But the lesson is for all of us. Do not discourage people, encourage them. When you see things wrong happening, take it as your own son. Take it as your own brother, your own sister, your own family member. Embrace them, teach them in a positive way, not negative way. You cannot start dooming people. Brother, you're going to Jahannam. So the young man came to me and told me, that guy told me I'm going to Jahannam. I said, go and ask him. He can only know because he is there. <laughs> he must have seen you there. <laughs> How can you start declaring this and that? Do you own Jannah and Jahannam? Have hope in Allah. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, I am convinced that the mercy of Allah alone will bring us all gathered in Jannatul Firdaus one day. Say Amen. It's the mercy of Allah. He will do it. Ask yourself, the people seated next to me, around me, do I have love in my heart for them? If you don't, please work on your heart. It needs help. Spread love, not hate. If you have hatred in your heart for the people around you, you are sick, you are ill, you need help. You need urgent help. Open. Learn to forgive. Learn to be open. Learn to look at people with the eye of love. Smile at them. To smile is a charity. Subhanallah. 
So that was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He made such a powerful dua for guidance. And you know what? They became Muslimin. Today you go to Ta'if, they're Muslims. What happened? It was that bridge that was built. He offered them dignity through dua. How many of you or how many of us, myself included, make dua for those whom we don't get along with, those we disagree with, those we may dislike some of their characteristics or their conduct. How many make a positive dua? When the Prophet ﷺ knew that the worst enemy was a man known as Amr ibn Hisham. He was also known as Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was the worst enemy. After him, there was another man. You will be surprised to hear what his name was. Umar ibn al-Khattab. Radiyallahu anhu. He was an enemy at the beginning. He was going out to murder the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua, Allahumma a'izz al-Islama bi ahad al-Umarayn. Oh Allah, grant strength to this deen of Islam by the acceptance of Islam of one of these two men who are powerful but they're enemies. Who are they? Either Amr ibn Hisham or Umar ibn al-Khattab. A little while later, here comes Umar. Look at the bridge that was built through dua, through supplication. Here comes Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He says, O Messenger, I bear witness that Allah is one and that you are the messenger of Allah. Short space of time he came. Why? A bridge was built through dua, not through curse, not through calling people names, not through hatred, not through contaminating the minds of our innocent children against our fellow Muslims. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. You want to enter jannah? Those who have said la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, they will enter jannah. Subhanallah, Jannah is a broad place. It's not just for you, it's for all of us. Today we sit and we start telling people, you're not going to paradise, you're not going to, you know what? To get to paradise, you need to cross a bridge. We are busy building that bridge. Do you know what bridge it is? Subhanallah, there is one bridge that is actually physically there. That is a different bridge known as As Sirat. As Sirat. A bridge thin as a hair. Each person has to cross it to get into Jannah. May Allah make it easy for us to cross. You want to cross it? You need two characteristics according to the hadith. Taqwa Allahi wa husnul khuluqi. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked, please tell us the characteristics of the people of heaven. He says they have two characteristics. They had consciousness of Allah and they have character and conduct. Good character and conduct. The two go hand in hand. That's why one narration says a person can arrive at a very, very high status, almost close to the status of some of th those who were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his character and conduct. Speak to people with respect, dignity. Look at the Prophet sallallahu I spoke about Ta'if. I want to speak about something else. Here comes the day. When the land that was taken from the people of Mecca, when the land that was taken from the Muslims by the people of Mecca was about to be reclaimed. When the oppression that the people of Mecca had done on the Muslims who had been driven out of their homes to Medina was now coming to an end because they had marched back onto Mecca. That day was known as Fath Mecca, the victory of Mecca. The victory of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ marched with thousands of his companions onto Mecca. Why? Not because Islam wanted to be spread by violence. No. They had stolen property. They had driven people out of their homes. These people were now coming back legitimately to claim what was theirs. And the Prophet ﷺ on that day was right at the top. Even from a political perspective, they knew no competition. This man is the winner. He has an army that can make us into mince, literally mince us, completely gone. But the Prophet wasallam, he came into Mecca with thousands, tens of thousands of companions. They were ready for anything, anything. You instruct us, we're ready. He says, 
Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh. He gathered the people of Quraysh. Mada tadunnuna anni fa'ilun bikum. What do you really think I'm going to do to you today? This was at the end. This was now victory. Khalas, victory of Makkah. The armies are all here. The people are all there. These people were the enemies. They killed, they maimed, they insulted, they did everything. They usurped wealth. They drove people out of their homes. They really caused havoc. And they were, the bulk of them had not yet even accepted Islam. They were asked, what do you think I'm going to do to you? Now, what do, what do you think you want him to do to you? Imagine, put yourself in that particular moment. What do you think they would have said? They said, well, look, you know, we're hoping for good here. He says, oh, people of Quraysh, I'm going to tell you what my brother Joseph Yusuf alayhi salam told his brothers. I'm telling you what the prophet Joseph or Yusuf alayhi salam told his brothers. There will be no retribution today. Go, all of you are free. We are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, that woke them up. They were shocked. They were stunned. They did not expect that. When you can forgive, you've built the biggest bridge ever, ever through forgiveness. Forgive others. Allah will forgive you. When it's very difficult to forgive and you let go, you have improved your health to begin with. When you hold a grudge and another one and a third one, even if it is justified, it is still a burden on your shoulders. The sweetness of tasting, meaning the sweetness of the, the forgiveness that you shall taste when you forgive others after they have wronged you in a big way is something no one can describe. You have to go through it yourself. We cannot forgive our brothers, our uncles, our sisters, I don't even want to go to in-laws. See, I told you. We don't want to forgive. We don't. And here's the Prophet ﷺ. What did he teach you? Your messenger, my messenger, our messenger. The Islam came through him to us. We claim to be his followers. When he was at the most powerful juncture in terms of the armies and the numbers, he says, I forgive you. Go, you're free. They were shocked. They said, this is only a messenger. It resulted in them accepting Islam wholesale. Why? They saw the bridge being built. They saw, what did he give them? He gave them dignity, honor, respect. As a result, they came towards Allah. They came towards Allah. That is Islam. That is the Islam I was taught. That is the Islam we have been taught for centuries. Unfortunately, due to pockets amongst us who like to spread hate and try to brainwash our little children at times into believing that your faith is filled with hate for anyone who disagrees with you. How can we allow that? I've given you example after example from the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that proves that he did not teach that. Yes, when someone does wrong, when someone associates partners with Allah, when someone wants to involve in that which is totally unacceptable, etc., we dislike the deed completely, but we still have hope and love for the individual. That's my brother, that's my father, that's my son, that's my sister, that's my mother, that could be anyone. It is. So I will treat them like a family member who's gone astray and I will keep working on them. May Allah guide us all. Like I said at the beginning of this speech, my brothers and sisters, I am here to spread love. I know that there will always be people who only think negative. They only think the worst. They only think bad. They only have bad things to say about others. We need to change this. I need to change it. I have tried and I will continue trying. And trust me, it makes a difference. It will make you, it will liberate you. It will liberate you to start thinking positively. Think positively. As a Muslim, think positive. Don't think doom and gloom and negative for everyone. Not everyone is that way. 
Think positive. You will feel so good. You will have, you will give meaning to your life. But I want you to learn to develop your relationship with Allah. Don't miss your prayer. Don't engage in immorality. Like I said, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said two qualities are the qualities of those who achieve heaven and Jannah. One is taqwa Allah, the consciousness of Allah. And two is development of character and conduct. Those who have high levels of character and conduct. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, khiyarukum ahasinukum akhlaqan. The best from amongst you are those who have the best character and conduct. Ask yourself today, tomorrow, and every day, do I have the best character and conduct? If not, you cannot be calling yourself a good Muslim. Work on your character. Work on your conduct. And charity begins at home. You start with those whom you live with. Spend time with your children. Today, children are going astray because parents don't spend time with them. Today, families are breaking because no one gives each other time. Imagine you put your phone away and you concentrate on your family for a while. It's something rare today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. May Allah open our doors. One hour, 30 minutes and six seconds, mashallah. We're into overtime, injury time. I think I took about 35 seconds talking about that car. My brothers and sisters, I really enjoyed speaking to you. I pray that Allah accept it from us. I would have loved to have shaken everybody's hands. I wouldn't have minded coming through and shaking everyone's hands. But as you know, it's impossible due to our large numbers. So I want to tell you what is important is not shaking my hand. But what is important is being shaken by the message. That's the most important thing. You can shake my hand a million times, but if you're not shaken by the message, what was the point? This hand is so sinful. It's not going to get you into paradise. You, can't, you will never be able to arrive on the day of judgment and say, well, my good deed is one day I shook that guy's hand. That might just be the worst deed. May Allah forgive us. But if I have improved because of the message and you have improved by the message, it's the message of Allah that made you acquainted with me in the first place. If you ask yourself, how do I know this man? Your answer will be because of Islam. Am I right? There you go. If I did not preach what Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, we would not know each other. So let's keep it that way. The, the power, the respect belongs to Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are just brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah. We love each other, we respect each other. But if I have to run away just now, please forgive me. Don't say he's arrogant, I promise you. I wish I could actually, you know, make everyone happy. But alhamdulillah, I'm sure you appreciate. We perhaps will get another moment sometime. Jazakumullah khair. I think I'm going to be walking straight out of here and disappearing. So please forgive me for that. It might sound, you might say he was just speaking about character and conduct and look at what he's just done, <laughs> disappeared. So that's why I'm letting you know in advance, we are just human beings like you. I also need a lot of help. I need to improve myself as well. If you notice anything bad from me, please correct me in a beautiful way uh, without the insults inshallah. And I promise I will do the same. May Allah bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Ta'ala grant us goodness. Unfortunately or fortunately, we'll have to go into overtime, maybe three or four minutes because of the land cruiser, right? Injury time. So my brothers and sisters, let me take you through one of the most touching incidents in the seerah and the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he lost his uncle. He lost his wife Khadija, binti Khawailid, radiallahu anha. He lost, meaning what had happened, they just had sanctions against them as Muslimin, Shi'ab Abi Talib. It was known as Amul Huzun, the year of sadness. He decided, you know what? Let me go out of Mecca. Perhaps the people outside might listen. I've been trying with these people for so long. They haven't heard. He didn't label them. He didn't swear them. He did not insult them. He didn't insult the people of Mecca. And he just kept on trying. 
Because he knows my job is the trial. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. If Allah wants, he can guide the person you are swearing. And he can take the guidance away from you and I. May he not do that for us. But may he guide us all. So he thought to himself, let me go. And it was from Allah, inspired as well. He went to Ta'if. He decided, let me go to Ta'if. Ta'if is outside, right? When he got to Ta'if, he wanted to call the people towards the beautiful deen, towards honesty, towards respecting the women, towards fulfilling their rights, towards issuing, you know, worshipping Allah alone, and so many other powerful good teachings. What did they do? They insulted him. They started laughing, cracking jokes, insulting verbally. My brothers and sisters, be careful of this habit. It's very bad. You know why? It will result in killing. It will result in stone throwing and killing. If you don't watch your mouth, it will become out of control very soon. So be careful. Watch your tongue. When you disagree with someone, disagree with them with respect. If you don't watch your tongue, you will end up killing one another for butter and bread, for something minor. So what happened to the Prophet ﷺ? They started off with the tongue, mocking. It developed very quickly into stone throwing with the intention of murder. They started throwing. And from the adults, it went to the children. Look at what we are doing. When you as a father do not control your tongue with those whom you disagree with, your children will become so vulgar that they will be an embarrassment for you as an adult. So carry yourself with respect so that at least your children can learn to be respectful. When they disagree on principle, they can disagree with respect. Today we need to go around the globe teaching people how to disagree. May Allah help myself to begin with and then every one of us. So the children started throwing stones and they hurt the Prophet ﷺ. The most blessed droplets of blood ever to exist were, were trickling down the legs of the most blessed of all creation. And imagine they filled the shoes. And at that juncture, the angels came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the instruction of Allah saying, O Messenger, there are two mountains here. If you just instruct us, we will bring these two mountains and crush all of these people who have harmed you to this degree. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu except as a means of mercy for all the worlds, for all. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where there was no bridge at all, Ta'if, decided to build the biggest bridge that there could be in that area. What was it? He raises his hands to Allah. In supplication and he complains about himself Allahumma inni ashku ilayka dha'fa quwwati wa qillata heelati oh Allah I'm complaining to you about myself I'm weak you have given me a message to fulfill here I am oh Allah forgive these guide these people oh Allah guide these people they don't know what they're doing that was his dua Allahumma di qawmi fa innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide these people. They don't even know what they're doing. It was so easy to say, finish them up. I think that's what a lot of us would have said. You just look back and say, you just nod your head to the gangster at the back to say, finish them. Walk out. Yeah. That's what we would do, especially when you're a bit powerful. This was the most powerful person ever to exist. Most powerful, the most noble, the highest. When we speak of Muhammad sallallahu there's no competition, there's no comparison. He is at the top. You need to remember this. 
creation, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The one whom we expect his intercession for us on the day of Qiyamah. And he's standing there saying to the non-Muslims, those who attacked him, they caused the blood to trickle down his leg. He says, oh Allah, guide these people. They don't know. They don't know. He left Taif in a unique way as though he was the loser. But he was not the loser. He just built a huge bridge from which they would all come and accept Islam a few years later. We are so impatient that if someone doesn't think exactly how we think today, he's written off, he's crushed, you can't read Salah behind him, you cannot go to this masjid, you cannot do this, this guy is like that, you can't greet him, you can't talk to him. Where is this? Which prophet are you following, by the way? Here is the prophet of Islam. This is what he did. He made dua. He tried. He spoke. A man came into the masjid and urinated one day. He peed in the corner of the mosque. Subhanallah. Today, one of our youngsters, after watching football, came into the masjid with the three quarters. Half of the people would say, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah, from what? The guy is coming to the mosque. He's coming to the masjid. Encourage him. Give him a, a word of goodness. Why chase him away? There is more pressure for him not to come than for him to come. So you're supposed to welcome him. Rather than that, we broke the bridge, completely destroyed. What else did we do? No respect for a human being who came to the house of Allah. Not your house or mine. Who brought him there? Allah. When Allah drives you somewhere, who brought you there? It's Allah who brings you to his house. Do you see the one who is cursed by Allah? The one who stops people from praying or who stopped the worshiper praying when he wanted to pray. Yes, this verse goes back to Abu Jahl at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But the lesson is for all of us. Do not discourage people, encourage them. When you see things wrong happening, take it as your own son, take it as your own brother, your own sister, your own family member. Embrace them, teach them in a positive way, not negative way. You cannot start dooming people. Brother, you're going to Jahannam. So the young man came to me and told me, that guy told me I'm going to Jahannam. I said, go and ask him. He can only know because he is there. <laughs> he must have seen you there. <laughs> How can you start declaring this and that? Do you own Jannah and Jahannam? Have hope in Allah. My brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, I am convinced that the mercy of Allah alone will bring us all gathered in Jannatul Firdaus one day. Say Amen. It's the mercy of Allah. He will do it. Ask yourself, the people seated next to me, around me, do I have love in my heart for them? If you don't, please work on your heart. It needs help. Spread love, not hate. If you have hatred in your heart for the people around you, you are sick, you are ill, you need help. You need urgent help. Open. Learn to forgive. Learn to be open. Learn to look at people with the eye of love. Smile at them. To smile is a charity. Subhanallah. So that was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He made such a powerful dua for guidance. And you know what? They became Muslimin. Today you go to Ta'if, they're Muslims. What happened? It was that bridge that was built. He offered them dignity through dua. How many of you or how many of us, myself included, make dua for those whom we don't get along with, those we disagree with, those we may dislike some of their characteristics or their conduct. How many make a positive dua? When the Prophet ﷺ knew that the worst enemy was a man known as Amr ibn Hisham. He was also known as Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl was the worst enemy. After him, there was another man. You will be surprised to hear what his name was. Umar ibn al-Khattab. Radiyallahu anhu. He was an enemy. 
at the beginning. He was going out to murder the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua, Allahumma a'izz al-Islama bi ahad al-Umarayn. Oh Allah, grant strength to this deen of Islam by the acceptance of Islam of one of these two men who are powerful but they're enemies. Who are they? Either Amr ibn Hisham or Umar ibn Khattab. A little while later, here comes Umar. Look at the bridge that was built through dua, through supplication. Here comes Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. He says, O Messenger, I bear witness that Allah is one and that you are the Messenger of Allah. Short space of time he came. Why? A bridge was built through dua, not through curse, not through calling people names, not through hatred, not through contaminating the minds of our innocent children against our fellow Muslims. Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al jannah. You want to enter jannah? Those who have said la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, they will enter jannah. Subhanallah. Jannah is a broad place. It's not just for you, it's for all of us. Today we sit and we start telling people, you're not going to paradise. You're not going to, you know what? To get to paradise, you need to cross a bridge. We are busy building that bridge. Do you know what bridge it is? Subhanallah. There is one bridge that is actually physically there. That is a different bridge known as As Sirat. As Sirat. A bridge thin as a hair. Each person has to cross it to get into Jannah. May Allah make it easy for us to cross. You want to cross it? You need two characteristics according to the hadith. Taqwa Allahi wa husnul khuluqi. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was asked, please tell us the characteristics of the people of heaven. He says they have two characteristics. They had consciousness of Allah and they have character and conduct. Good character and conduct. The two go hand in hand. That's why one narration says, a person can arrive at a very, very high status, almost close to the status of some of th those who were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his character and conduct. Speak to people with respect, dignity. Look at the Prophet sallallahu I spoke about Ta'if, I want to speak about something else. Here comes the day. When the land that was taken from the people of Makkah, when the land that was taken from the Muslims by the people of Makkah was about to be reclaimed. When the oppression that the people of Makkah had done on the Muslims who had been driven out of their homes to Medina was now coming to an end because they had marched back onto Makkah. That day was known as Fath Makkah, the victory of Makkah. The victory of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ marched with thousands of his companions onto Mecca. Why? Not because Islam wanted to be spread by violence. No. They had stolen property. They had driven people out of their homes. These people were now coming back legitimately to claim what was theirs. And the Prophet ﷺ on that day was right at the top. Even from a political perspective, they knew no competition. This man is the winner. He has an army that can make us into mince, literally mince us, completely gone. But the Prophet wasallam, he came into Mecca with thousands, tens of thousands of companions. They were ready for anything, anything. You instruct us, we're ready. He says, Ya Ma'ashara Quraysh. He gathered the people of Quraysh. Mada tadunnuna anni fa'ilum bikum. What do you really think I'm going to do to you today? This was at the end. This was now victory. Khalas, victory of Mecca. The armies are all here. The people are all there. These people were the enemies. They killed, they maimed, they insulted, they did everything. They usurped wealth. They drove people out of their homes. They really caused havoc and they were the bulk of them had not yet even accepted Islam. They were asked, what do you think I'm going to do to you? Now, what do, what do you think you want him to do to you? Imagine, put yourself in that particular moment. What do you think they would have said? They said, well, look, you know, we're hoping for good here. 
He says, O oh people of Quraysh, I am going to tell you what my brother Joseph Yusuf alayhi salam told his brothers, La tathriba alaykum al yawm, idhabu fa antum tulaqa. I am telling you what the Prophet Joseph or Yusuf alayhi salam told his brothers. There will be no retribution today. Go, all of you are free. We are forgiven. Brothers and sisters, that woke them up. They were shocked. They were stunned. They did not expect that. When you can forgive, you've built the biggest bridge ever, ever through forgiveness. Forgive others, Allah will forgive you. When it's very difficult to forgive and you let go, you have improved your health to begin with. When you hold a grudge and another one and a third one, even if it is justified, it is still a burden on your shoulders. The sweetness of tasting, meaning the sweetness of the, the forgiveness that you shall taste when you forgive others after they have wronged you in a big way is something no one can describe. You have to go through it yourself. We cannot forgive our brothers, our uncles, our sisters. I don't even want to go to in-laws. See, I told you, we don't want to forgive. We don't. And here's the Prophet ﷺ, what did he teach you? Your messenger, my messenger, our messenger, the Islam came through him to us. We claim to be his followers. When he was at the most powerful juncture in terms of the armies and the numbers, he says, I forgive you. Go, you're free. They were shocked. They said, this is only a messenger. It resulted in them accepting Islam wholesale. Why? They saw the bridge being built. They saw what did he give them? He gave them dignity, honor, respect. As a result, they came towards Allah. They came towards Allah. That is Islam. That is the Islam I was taught. That is the Islam we have been taught for centuries. Unfortunately, due to pockets amongst us, who like to spread hate and try to brainwash our little children at times into believing that your faith is filled with hate for anyone who disagrees with you. How can we allow that? I've given you example after example from the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that proves that he did not teach that. Yes, when someone does wrong, when someone associates partners with Allah, when someone wants to involve in that which is totally unacceptable, etc. We dislike the deed completely, but we still have hope and love for the individual. That's my brother. That's my father. That's my son. That's my sister. That's my mother. That could be anyone. It is. So I will treat them like a family member who's gone astray and I will keep working on them. May Allah guide us all. Like I said at the beginning of this speech, my brothers and sisters, I am here to spread love. I know that there will always be people who only think negative. They only think the worst. They only think bad. They only have bad things to say about others. We need to change this. I need to change it. I have tried and I will continue trying. And trust me, it makes a difference. It will make you, it will liberate you. It will liberate you to start thinking positively. Think positively. As a Muslim, think positive. Don't think doom and gloom and negative for everyone. Not everyone is that way. Think positive. You will feel so good. You will have, you will give meaning to your life. But I want you to learn to develop your relationship with Allah. Don't miss your prayer. Don't engage in immorality. Like I said, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said two qualities are the qualities of those who achieve heaven and Jannah. One is taqwa Allah, the consciousness of Allah. And two is development of character and conduct. Those who have high levels of character and conduct. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, khiyarukum ahasinukum akhlaqan. The best from amongst you are those who have the best character and conduct. Ask yourself today, tomorrow and every day do I have the best character and conduct
If not, you cannot be calling yourself a good Muslim. Work on your character. Work on your conduct. And charity begins at home. You start with those whom you live with. Spend time with your children. Today, children are going astray because parents don't spend time with them. Today, families are breaking because no one gives each other time. Imagine you put your phone away and you concentrate on your family for a while. It's something rare today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. May Allah open our doors. One hour, 30 minutes and six seconds, mashallah. We're into overtime, injury time. I think I took about 35 seconds talking about that car. My brothers and sisters, I really enjoyed speaking to you. I pray that Allah accept it from us. I would have loved to have shaken everybody's hands. I wouldn't have minded coming through and shaking everyone's hands. But as you know, it's impossible due to our large numbers. So I want to tell you what is important is not shaking my hand. But what is important is being shaken by the message. That's the most important thing. You can shake my hand a million times, but if you're not shaken by the message, what was the point? This hand is so sinful. It's not going to get you into paradise. You, can't, you will never be able to arrive on the day of judgment and say, well, my good deed is one day I shook that guy's hand. That might just be the worst deed. May Allah forgive us. But if I have improved because of the message and you have improved by the message, it's the message of Allah that made you acquainted with me in the first place. If you ask yourself, how do I know this man? Your answer will be because of Islam. Am I right? There you go. If I did not preach what Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, we would not know each other. So let's keep it that way. The, the power, the respect belongs to Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are just brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah. We love each other, we respect each other. But if I have to run away just now, please forgive me. Don't say he's arrogant, I promise you. I wish I could actually you know, make everyone happy, but alhamdulillah, I'm sure you appreciate. We perhaps will get another moment sometime. Jazakumullah khair. I think I'm going to be walking straight out of here and disappearing. So please forgive me for that. It might sound, you might say he was just speaking about character and conduct and look at what he's just done, <laughs> disappeared. So that's why I'm letting you know in advance, we are just human beings like you. I also need a lot of help. I need to improve myself as well. If you notice anything bad from me, please correct me in a beautiful way uh, without the insults, inshallah. And I promise I will do the same. May Allah bless you all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.